So this morning we're continuing through a series called His Story. Uh, it's going through the life of Christ. Uh, and today we are going to cover the witness of John the Baptist. And you might be looking at me like, Pastor, if we're covering the life of Christ, then why are we going to talk about John the Baptist today? Well, John the Baptist is a very important part of the life of Christ. Uh, John the Baptist was necessary uh, that he came before Christ. Uh, so John the Baptist is a very important person. He was prophesied about in the Old Testament to be the forerunner of Christ, essentially, to uh, essentially prepare the way for Christ to come. So uh, he prepared the people to receive him. Um, and so we have to talk about John the Baptist if we're talking about uh, the life of Christ. He's, you know, essential to that story. So um, let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll go ahead and open up God's Word. Dear Lord, Thank you for this day. Uh, I thank you that uh, we can come together and meet, Lord, and um, I pray that as we move forward this morning that you keep our hearts and our minds open uh, and ready to, to what you have to teach us uh, and help us to absorb uh, your word, Lord, and be able to recall it later when we need it. I pray, pray, Lord, that as we move forward this morning that you just put us in a state of worship as we hear your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. So, uh, John the Baptist is so important, in fact, that John, the writer of the book of John, includes John the Baptist in his opening statement. And so when he's introducing Jesus, he takes a moment to pause and introduce John the Baptist, because John the Baptist is important. That should tell us just how important he is. And so John introduces uh, John the Baptist as the witness to the light. Uh, this is in John chapter 1, and we're going to go ahead and read verses 1 through 9, just so we can kind of understand why he's thrown into this passage here. And so John chapter 1, starting at verse 1, says, uh, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man, so that it's, he just abruptly shifts, shifts to John the Baptist here. He says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. And then John the writer would go on, go on later to explain that in verse 14, the word became flesh. And we know for sure that this is talking about Jesus Christ. Um, so in this very important introduction in the book of John uh, about Jesus, he throws in John the Baptist, the witness of that light. Why is that important? Well, Jesus didn't just testify of himself. Jesus himself declared that there were others that uh, testified of him. You know, the, John the Baptist, his own works, the Father, the Holy Spirit, all of these testified of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist is included in that by Jesus himself. So, who was John the Baptist? Who was he? Well, you might look at me and go, preacher, again, that's, a, that's an easy one. He was John the Baptist. He was a Baptist. That's what he did. He, he, he baptized people. That's who John the Baptist was. Well, this is actually an important question to answer. Now, first, before we get into that, so what, is John the, what does that mean, that he was a Baptist, right? The word baptizo is the Greek word, right? We actually transliterate that word into English, so that means that it's not 
translated. We're not given, we're not, uh, they don't take the meaning of the Greek word and put that into the English form. They literally take the Greek word and then put that into English letters. Where, that's where we get the word baptize from. So it's actually not a translation there when you see it in your Bibles. So the translation for baptize is to immerse. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but it's to immerse or to dunk. So my, when I see John the Baptist in the Bible, I think John the dunker. Because that's what he did. He actually, he was in the river and he was dunking people in water. He fully submerged them. Why is this important? Well, he didn't just do this with Greeks. He didn't just do this with Gentiles. He also did this with Jews. And to most Jews, this would be an unacceptable practice. Uh, God's people, in their minds, did not need to be baptized. Only proselytes needed to be baptized. And so John the Baptist was doing something that they didn't like. So again, I'll ask, who was he? In the minds of the Jews, they're thinking, who is this guy? Well, let's read in John chapter 1 still, verse 19 through 20. So we're going to, uh, or sorry, 19 through 22. And we're, we're skipping down a little bit, but this is what John, the writer of the book of John, says. It says, now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, or sorry, he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? So when we ask this question, who was he? Well, first we have to look at who were the priests trying to claim that John was? You see, when they were going to him, asking him these questions, they were trying to trip him up. Uh, see, there were, it was not uncommon for men to claim that they were the Messiah, and these men would be stoned. Uh, this was a blasphemy. And so when they are going to John the Baptist, they are trying to get him to say that he is one of those, thi one of those things that they said. They don't like what John is doing. So the first one that they ask him was, are you, uh, the, uh, the first thing they ask him is about him being the Messiah. So, and he says that it says that John confessed that he was not the Christ. Very plainly there. So that one's out, right? The, the priest couldn't claim that he said he was the Christ. So now how do they try to trip him up? Well, uh, are you Elijah? This one's pretty interesting. Are you Elijah, they asked him. He says, I am not. Well, Elijah uh, was an Old Testament prophet that the Jews believed that someone was going to come that was going to be in the likeness of Elijah, the forerunner of the Messiah, right? Right? Well, John says that he's not that person, and we'll get back to that later. But Malachi 4, 5 is this, uh, this verse that they were looking forward to uh, because God said uh, in Malachi 4, 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Okay, so this is the verse that the Jews were looking at to be prophecy about the coming Messiah. They were looking for this person who was going to come before. This was in their minds. Then they said, are you the prophet? Right? Uh, that may seem like a general term, but this was also a 
prophecy from the Old Testament. The Jews were again looking for some sort of prophet to come as kind of a herald or uh, as possibly even the Messiah himself. In Deuteronomy 18.15 says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, this is Moses talking, uh, from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. And so this was another prophecy that the Jews were looking towards to be fulfilled. John the Baptist says, I'm not this person. John is very humble here. He's very humble. So all of these things that they are throwing at him to try to trip, you, trip him up, he's saying, no, I'm not that person. Just listen to what I'm teaching, essentially. It doesn't matter any of that. So then, as we move on, John will say who he is. John 1, 23 through 26. It says, He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said, Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. So who did John say that he was? Who did John say that he was? He makes a very profound statement there when they ask him to just state for himself who he was. He says, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. John simply says that he's just a voice. In other words, John is saying, I'm a nobody. Pay attention to the message not the messenger. That's what John is saying to them. Make straight the way of the Lord. That was his message. And so he is there to prepare the way for Christ to come. Now, the Jews here asked him another question. So if he's not any of those, it says, why then do you baptize If you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet. So they ask him this other question. What, who are you to do this? If you're not any of those, what's your authority, right? Again, trying to trip him up. He doesn't actually answer this question. Instead, he just points again to Christ. You see, he says, well, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you who you do not know. You see, John was, again, doing something the Israelites didn't like. He was baptizing Jews. What this meant was, is that John was saying that the Jews needed to be cleansed just like the Gentiles. They didn't like this. And so they're, again, again, trying to trip him up. What authority are you doing this? Well, he points to Christ. And he says, Christ is already among you. See, these Pharisees were so focused on what John was doing, what they didn't like, they didn't even realize that Jesus was already, Jesus was already getting started. But who did Jesus say John was? It, it's important to hear. Pharisees or the priest thought of John the Baptist. It's important to hear what he thought of himself, but ultimately none of that matters to us because we know what Jesus thought of John the Baptist. Jesus' opinion is way above all of the others. So if you go to John chapter 5, this is verse 32 to 35. Jesus says a couple of things about John the Baptist here when he is talking about the witnesses of himself. He says, 
In verse 32, there is another who bears witness of me. And I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent to John, and he is borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. So Jesus says a couple of things here. First, Jesus states John as an important witness of, to who he is. That alone is a great honor. Can you imagine Jesus himself saying that this person was important and this person was a witness to him? Jesus himself acknowledged John the Baptist. Then Jesus said something even more awesome than that, that John was a burning and shining lamp. In your Bibles, it might say light there, but understand that the word for light there, it means a lamp or uh, something that gives light, not the light itself. You see, John was there to bear witness of the light. He was there to show Christ's light to people. So when Jesus says that he is a burning and shining lamp, he's saying John did his job. John did his job. He also says something about John while John is in prison. Uh, this is in Matthew chapter 11, and I would encourage you uh, at some point to read most of this chapter. Uh, but we're just going to read verse 13 and 14. This sums this up here, what Jesus is saying about John the Baptist. See, John is in prison now, and he is about to be executed. But Jesus says that John, uh, starting at verse 13, it says, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. So he was one of the Old Testament prophets, and in, in fact, the last of the Old Testament prophets. And then it says, And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. Jesus said John is Elijah. But John said he wasn't. Why? It's an interesting question. But John was being humble. It was not for John to take the credit for that. It was for Jesus to state who John was. And if you look at all of the things that John did and all of the things that this prophet that was supposed to come before the Messiah was supposed to do, John fits that bill. And that's what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 11. So Jesus says John was an important witness as to who he was or who he is, that John was at a burning and shining lamp and that he was that promised prophet that was supposed to become before the Messiah. So John didn't claim any of these things for himself. Just said, hey, I'm just the voice of one crying in the wilderness. But Jesus then gave John the credit. It's amazing. So now that we know who John was, and we kind of see his character there, that he was a man not to take credit for himself, but let Christ do that. What about John's final sermon? You see, John's final sermon, again, just points towards Christ. This is in John chapter 3. And I'm going to go ahead and first read verses 25 through 26, and we're going to kind of see what's happening here. It says, Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. So again, this same old problem about baptism. It says, 
And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, who was he who was with you beyond the Jordan, whom you have testified, talking about Jesus, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. So it's important to understand what's happening here. So John's baptizing at the same time that Jesus is baptizing. And John's disciples are upset coming to John that all these other people are going to Jesus. That's what's happening here. So it's kind of an interesting situation. You have John who's trying to point towards Christ, but his own disciples are coming to him, jealous of all the people flocking to Jesus. And so there's some correction that's about to happen that John is about to say. So moving on to verse 27, we're going to read through verse 30. It says, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. So unless, anything, unless it's come, you can't get anything unless it's been given to you from God. Then it says, You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ. It's funny how John has to keep saying this to people. And it says, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. So John here says, first of all, you can't get anything unless it's given to you from heaven, unless it's given to you by God. Then he recaps what he had already been saying all along, that he was not the Christ, the one that was sent before him. And then, then he compares himself to basically the best man at a wedding. You see, this is where the correction hits really hard for John's disciples. You see, John said, it's not for me to gather attention to myself. He said, he's basically saying he is happy that people are going to Jesus. He rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. And so he's the one that is standing to the side of Christ while other people are supposed to be going to Christ. Then he says that Jesus must increase and John must decrease. And so John is supposed to fade out and Jesus is supposed to get all the attention. You see, this is a perfect analogy for us. This is a perfect picture for how we are supposed to be as followers of Christ. We are supposed to fade into the background. That way Christ gets all of the glory. You see, we, when we spread the gospel, it's not to draw attention to ourselves and say, look at how awesome I am. I led X amount of people to Christ. No. When people come to, Christ, come to know Christ, whether it was you that helped share the message or not, it should be, wow, look at how awesome Christ is that people came to him. Then in verse 31 through 35, he says, he who comes from above is above all. Now, uh, as a side note here, John, throughout this passage here, is being very careful with his wording as to not incriminate Christ. And so, remember, they were looking for Jesus to claim that he, he himself was the Messiah. Jesus wasn't doing this yet, right? Right? Jesus was keeping that, it wasn't the right timing yet. And so we didn't want that to be cut off early. That's not what John wanted. And so John's being very careful with his wording as to not out Jesus. And so that's what uh, we'll see here. He who comes from above is above all. Uh, undisputable fact, right? Uh, if someone comes from heaven, they are above everything. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. 
No Jew would dispute that. It just, if John had attached that to Jesus, then they would have disputed it. Then it says, What has been seen and heard that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. All indisputable facts there. John just is stating facts to people. These are things that they wouldn't have been able to argue against. Jesus is above all. We know that John was talking about Jesus. And followers would have known that John was talking about Jesus. And then John says, everything has been given to him. The Father loves the Son and gives all things into his hand. So John is, his, John's whole purpose in life is to point towards Christ. That's how we should be. Our whole purpose in life should be to point towards Christ. John gives one last statement, and this will be the conclusion this morning as the pianist and song leader come. The last message, if you will, of John the Baptist, this last line here, it says in John 3, 36, and you might actually recognize this because it's very similar to John 3, 16. It says, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Sounds like John 3, 16, right? There's a, this is a very interesting verse because the English does not do it justice. So first, look at that word believe. We see the word believe twice. Believes and then does not believe, Right? You would think, looking that at, at, at that in English, that those would be the same Greek word or two different versions of the same Greek word, when in fact they are completely different Greek words. So the first one uh, for believe actually is exactly as it says. It's basically to have faith. And so John's saying, he who has faith in the Son has everlasting life. Pretty obvious. It's the second one that's very interesting. Because while it does mean believe, it has a very different understanding of the word believe. So that word does not believe is one word, okay, in the Greek. But that word for does not believe means to disobey. In other words, what John the Baptist is saying here, he's saying if you have faith in the Son, you have everlasting life. But if you don't believe in the Son, that is actually an act of disobedience and you shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. And so you believe, that's a good thing. If you don't believe, that is actually an act of disobedience. That is a sin in and of itself. Just not believing in Christ is a sin. It's enough to damn you even if you have done nothing else wrong in life, which we know for a fact that we all do other things wrong in life, but simply not believing in Jesus is a sin. Then it says, so another interesting Greek word here, when it says the wrath of God abides on him, that word abide, okay? That means like to dwell, right? It means remains or stays. And so the wrath of God is already on you if you're not believing. And if you come to believe in Christ, then it's no longer upon you. But if you don't believe, if you disobey, it is stuck on you. It stays on you. 
So here's what this means. This should say to you this morning is that there is a free gift when Jesus came and died on the cross that he died for all of our sins. That way we might have eternal life if you accept it. If you don't, because Jesus has done all of that, if you don't accept Christ, that is an act of disobedience. It's not just you cannot claim ignorance before God. You are literally, if you are hearing the gospel and then you try to stand before God someday and you say, well, God, I didn't know. That's not true. You rejected Christ. You heard and you rejected. Don't do that this morning. It's a very beautiful thing what Jesus did because that wrath of God was already upon us. But Jesus came and died for all of our sins. That way we don't have to have the consequences of that. Would you come to him this morning? You have to do two things in order to have everlasting life and have a relationship with Christ. You have to repent and you have to believe. That's it. If you pray to God and you do those two things, repent and believe, you'll be saved forever. You can't lose it. Repent simply means to turn around or to turn away from your sin. And believing means believing in Christ as your Lord and Savior, not just believing that he existed. That's all you have to do this morning. Would you do that as we all stand? Five